Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q4 FY23 earnings conference call of Deepak Nitrite Limited, hosted by IIFL Securities Limited. At the outset, I would like to clarify that certain statements made or discussed on the conference call today may be forward looking in nature. And disclaimer to this effect has been included in the results presentation shared with you earlier. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode. And there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. I now hand the conference over to Mr. Akul Brochwala from IIFL Securities Limited. Thank you and over to yourself. Thank you, Michelle. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us on Deepak Nitrides Q4 and FI23 earnings conference call. Apologies for the delay. Today we have with us Mr. Malik Mehta, Executive Director and CEO, Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay, Director of Finance and Group CFO, and Mr. Somchekar Nanda, CFO. To begin with, Mr. Malik Mehta will share views on operating performance and the growth plans of the company, followed by Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay, who shall take us through the financial and segmental performance. I now invite Mr. Mehta to share his opening comments. Thank you and over to you, sir. Good day, everyone, and a warm welcome to Deepak Nitrite's Q4 and FY24 earnings conference call. I hope you've had an opportunity to go through our results documents that were shared earlier. We entered 23 with a very challenging business landscape characterized by diverse internal and external factors. The Russia-Ukraine war has served to fracture the global supply chain for crude, fertilizers, petrochemical derivatives, and specialty chemicals. Led to large rises in input prices across the board, resulting in a secular inflationary pressure unlike anything witnessed in the recent past. The cascading effects of central banks across the globe raising interest rates rapidly, leading to a higher cost for capital, even as forex volatility rose and risk spreads expanded. Internally, we were faced with a shutdown of our Nandesari plant for more than 40 days due to a fire in June. There were challenges and constraints to logistics coupled with a rise in utility costs. It missed this volatility in spot prices. Both customers and suppliers were seeking to capitalize on short-term opportunities, even as they sought assured supply and purchase agreements. Notwithstanding these adversaries, we were able to navigate our schedules and fulfill all our supply obligations while maintaining wallet shares with all customers, hence guaranteeing a dependable and stable supply of products to all our clients. In this backdrop, I will give you a brief rundown of our performance for the fourth quarter and the financial year ended March 31st, 23, and the plans and strategic approach for the upcoming financial year. Mr. Upadhyay will then provide you with granular insights on our financial performance and position. We're pleased to share that Deepak Nitrite has displayed agility in achieving growth while maintaining the high quality and adhering to the safety standards that are expected of us. Diversification across products, end user segments, customers, geographies has been a bedrock of our strategy. This allowed us to be nimble and seek out more remunerative pockets of opportunity amidst operational and macroeconomic challenges. This has allowed us to maintain a strong and resilient business model. Leveraging off a solid foundation, incremental investments are tactically utilized to increase capacity and sustain demand from end user industries. And this has enabled us to drive a healthy top line growth of 17% year on year and set a new benchmark of exceeding 8,000 crores in annual revenue which is the first for our group. Despite recent cooling off in input prices, they continue to remain at elevated level, 
and more than that at volatile levels compared to the previous year. While profitability for the year is lower than that of the prior year, EBITDA and PAT in quarter four have grown in double digits compared to quarter three, indicating that operations are progressing in the right direction as we enter the new year. Coming to the performance of strategic business units, the advanced intermediate unit delivered an impressive revenue growth on the back of resilient demand from end user industries. And we actively pursued opportunities with both domestic and international customers during the period. We expect this segment to continue performing well, given the shift in global supply chains towards Asia and positive demand trends. However, it is worth noting that challenges around logistics and high raw material costs due to internal product, uh, product transfers at market prices with a time lag before prices are passed on. Future performance will be driven by several new multi-year contracts, successful pilots, and new product introductions in our basket. Deepak Phenolics witnessed a healthy top-line performance with some contribution from pricing, but largely driven by the continued increase in plant efficiencies. Our phenol plant recorded an average utilization of more than 120% for the quarter and achieved the highest ever quarterly domestic sales in Q4, along with the highest daily phenol production. If seen sequentially, Phenolix has improved in volume and profitability significantly. This was due to healthy demand and improved product acceptance, resulting in a significant increase in revenue realization for both phenol and acetone compared to the previous year. Sorry, compared to the previous quarter. Profitability in the business was lower than last year due to normalized realizations this year compared with the previous period, unusually high realizations. The phenolics business has been using more of acetone in its downstream products, and it is going to increase further upon the commissioning of projects under implementation, such as MIBC and MIBK, which are solvents, and we're optimistic about the prospects for the business in the future. FY23 has also been a year in which a lot of our future growth initiatives have started to take concrete shape. In a key development, de-bottlenecking is a crucial development for phenolics as it enables the company to increase its production and this is expected to come on stream within this quarter itself. Additionally, the company has approved the implementation of advanced process controls which is expected to be operational from the second quarter. That project is expected to further enhance the operational efficiency of phenolics and improve the quality of its products. These developments are expected to strengthen DPL's position in the market and enhance its competitiveness. I'm sorry to interrupt, sir. We are not able to hear you. Ladies and gentlemen, the line of the management has been disconnected. Kindly stay connected while we try to reconnect them. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently holding. The line for the management has been connected. Over to you, sir. Sorry for this interruption. I guess this is now part of new business processes. Uh, 
I will repeat the previous uh, paragraphs. Okay. FY 24, uh, 23 has also been a year in which a lot of our growth initiatives have taken concrete shape. In a key development, the bottlenecking is a crucial in, uh, development for uh, Deepak Phenolics as it enables the company to increase its production. This is expected to come on stream in this quarter itself. Additionally, the company has approved the implementation of an advanced process control project, which is expected to be operational from the next quarter. This project is expected to enhance the operational efficiency of DPL and improve the quality of its products. These developments are expected to further strengthen DPL's position in the market and enhance its competitiveness. In addition to our current projects, we're making strides towards expanding our business through several other ongoing initiatives. We've successfully commissioned the installation of our SAC unit, which significantly improves our sustainability in Nandesari. And we are planning to commission the photochlorination and fluorination project in the third quarter, followed by the acid project in the fourth quarter, which will take care of current and future needs. In the first quarter of FY25, we're scheduled to commission our MIBK and MIBC plants, both of which, as I mentioned, are derivatives of acetone. Additionally, our hydrogenation and multipurpose distillation facility has been approved, marking further progress in our expansion plans. During the period under review, we have achieved significant de-risking of the business through an assured supply of critical raw materials and paying down debt to strengthen the balance sheet. Additionally, with the Nandesari plant back to full operations and other plants running at a high utilization, we are working with good momentum. With multiple plants underway to be commissioned in the coming quarter, we're poised to deliver growth and create value to all our shareholders. Recognizing this, the board of directors has announced a final dividend of 7.5 rupees per equity share, which is 375%, a face value of 2 rupees each for FY22-23 in view of the company's steady performance. Before I conclude, I would also like to make a point that DNL's The Hage facility received an unprecedented score of 100 upon 100 in the Together for Sustainability audit. I just want to point out that TFS is very similar. It is the European counterpart to Responsible Care, which is an American institution. TFS is also recognized and highly valued by every single large European company and many large Japanese and American companies. This is the first time ever in the history of TFS that a company has received a perfect score in its first try. We are confident that this achievement is also going to be catalyzing many more such. I would now like to hand the call over to our Director of Finance, Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay, to address this forum and take you through the financial performance during the period. Thank you. Thank you, Molik. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this call today. I will walk you through the highlights for the financial results for the period ended March 23. During the period under review, Deepak achieved a positive top line performance despite facing macroeconomic challenges. In FY23, revenue stood at 8,020 crores, which is significant as compared to 6,845 in FY22, higher by 17%. This growth was attributable to stable demand and high plant efficiency, while EBITDA stood at 1,337 crores against uh, last year's, but it is lower by 19% on year on year basis because last year's base was very high. Pets stood at 852 crores in FY23 versus 1,067 crores last year. The results have been impacted due to war and resultant high input prices and resultant inflationary pressures. There has also been impact on the several external internal factors such as uh, summarized by Molik in his uh, comments. 
both business segments showed solid improvements contributing to strong revenue growth on a consolidated basis the increase in demand and relation to uh, for key, uh, key products drove the growth despite the challenging environment dnl remains focused on driving growth and expanding its operations to capture new opportunities further it's worth noting dnl subsidiary dctl has been actively expanding its team by hiring key personnel in various departments such as projects management procurement and support functions dnl has invested 400 crores in dctl towards part funding of the group's ongoing capital projects on the operating front our domestic business revenue stood at 1512 crores and 6410 crores in q4 and fy23 higher by 22% year on year respectively export revenues were 449 crores in q4 fy23 and 1562 in fy23 on a consolidated basis domestic to mix uh, domestic to our revenue and the mix is 77.23 for q4 fy23 in the quarter on a consolidated basis revenues grew by 5% at 1974 crores as compared to 1876 crores in q4 fy22 the impressive top line performance was fueled by high production volumes in several key products ebitda came at 361 crores compared to 414 crores in q4 fy22 in q4 fy23 pat stood at 234 crores versus 267 crores of last year profitability is lower on year on year this is due to high base in the previous year but the company has significantly improved profitability quarter on quarter in line with the operational performance moving to our segmental performance in our advanced intermediate segment revenue grew by 7% to 810 crores in q4 fy23 versus 759 crores in q4 fy22 The growth is owing to sustained healthy demand from key customers, while EBIT came at 137 crores, with a margin at 17 percent. As Malik mentioned, growth in EBIT has not kept with the pace with the revenue growth due to significant increase in input costs compared to the previous year. In FY23, revenue grew by 21 percent to 3,074 crores, and EBIT came at 555 crores, translating to margin of 18 percent despite the current environment and challenging circumstances. Deepak Analytics delivered an encouraging performance with a revenue growth of 3% to rupees 1173 crores in Q4 FY23 versus 1131 crores last year. The company has operated all plants except for Nandeshwari unit at high utilization rate. The phenol plant has clocked an average utilization of more than 120% or even higher for the quarter and achieved highest ever quarterly domestic sales and highest production per day of phenol. EBIT stood at 177 crores and EBIT margin came at 15% in the quarter. In FY23 revenue stood at 4986 crores and EBIT came at 594 crores translating into margin of 12%. While DNL has no debt DPL has prepared the term loan for an of an amount of 61 crores in the fourth quarter. For the full year FY23 the prepayment of term loan by DPL was 161 crores leading to a saving in interest cost. This has reduced net debt to equity ratio to almost zero, that is 0.03, as compared to last year's 0.20. On a consolidated basis, the surplus of uh, funds for DNL remains debt-free on a net debt basis, with a net worth of 4,090 crores and 2,675 crores of balance sheet. Is uh, our balance sheet is it has adequate headroom to raise growth capital for future expansions. the in the input on cash flows for the cash flow happened for the, the on this cash flow remains robust and we have reported operating cash flow of 650 crores in fy23 when evaluated against ebitda of cc uh, ocf and ebitda ratio at 4.49 we are entering into a fourth way fy24 with a de-risk business model a very robust balance sheet and pipeline of projects lined up for commissioning we are highly excited of our growth prospects and look forward to building a performance momentum before i conclude i would like to provide an update on the fire incident in nandeshwari facility that occurred on 2nd june 2022 against our insurance claim uh, we have for loss of material damage we have received an interim payment of 11 crores for the uh, in uh, in march 23 and further 14 crores in april 23 as the interim payment 
uh, balance is uh, will be i we hope to receive the balance in the coming quarter thank you for taking out the time to join our earning call uh, now though it is open for question and answer session thank you very much sir we will now begin the question and answer session anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star then one on that touchstone telephone if you wish to remove yourself from the question queue you may press star then two participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question ladies and gentlemen we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles we have the first question from the line of nirav jimodia from anvil research please go ahead yeah good afternoon team and uh, congratulations on a very good set of numbers so i have two questions so one is so when we see our performance in fy20 vis a vis what we have delivered in fy23 for the stand alone business i think our gross margins have remained at the similar levels like uh, at around close to 1370 crores but this has come with close to 32% higher turnover when we compare fy23 with fy20 so this could be a combination of a volume growth plus some raw material cost inflation which you just alluded in your opening remarks so my question is uh, uh, with the brownfield expansions and the de bottlenecking what we are undertaking in the standalone business how much of the volume growth can we expect for uh, fy24 and uh, though some of the raw material prices have corrected predominantly the ammonia prices which have cl corrected close to two third of the prices what they were in the month of december how much of our uh, current turnover of uh, 3000 crores in the stand alone business has a scope for margin expansion on a per kg basis so if you can just uh, uh, answer to this i can add up on one more question to this okay uh, so first of all you're right that there has been a lot of volatility including in ammonia however India continues to remain the most expensive buyer of ammonia in the world if i look at the indexes nonetheless it has certainly come down from its peaks last year now what has happened over a period of time also is that the fg prices will automatically correct as they adjust nonetheless we have been able to maintain a reasonably healthy margin on a per kilo basis and as we expand in uh, fy21 uh, we had a plant uh, which was about 15% less uh, in terms of its capacity than we have now okay so on a stable year you can expand i mean you can expect uh, sodium nitrite and its associated nitrate yeah. volumes to increase by about 15 uh, 15 to 18% and how this uh, results with regards to top line growth cycle to say because the market continues to be volatile Correct. we continue to maintain reasonably healthy margins which have been uh, you know as they were when ammonia prices were low as well as as they were when ammonia prices were high so uh, because you rightly said that turnover is difficult to predict because all depends upon the selling prices of the products but if we see fy20 we were close to 800 crores of operating profit when the ammonia prices were lower as as last year also we were at around 680 crores uh, though there so this year would have seen some cost inflation on uh, the operating cost side also because the plant was not running full and several other factors so what could be the fair assumption uh, based on the volume growth you just alluded upon uh, what could be the figure we should look upon because there could be some benefits coming to us in terms of some pockets of the raw material prices as well as reduction in the operating cost so, so neeraj uh, i would i would expect that fy24 and uh, fy21 one reason why they should not be compared is because one of the key raw materials uh, which we used to get as a large volume in a formula linked price which was linked to ammonia uh, prices yeah now we are forced to buy it in the spot market 
at uh, far higher prices. And we have to see how we can de-risk our supply chain itself. So for this year, I would say that one can expect a, uh, you know, a performance which is in Deepak Nitrite, similar to what it was last year, if we had not faced, uh, you know, the impact of the fire and I think between 40 to 60 days of lost production. Correct, correct. So, so we could be closer to FY22 performance in terms of our uh, absolute EBITDA numbers, right? Uh, Nira, let us just uh, interrupt here. You are comparing this with 1920. Am I right? Correct, sir. Correct. In 1920, we were at 800 crores. Yeah, but you are just seeing the absolute number. 1920 has a, had a very abnormal year for Dazda. You know, we have been, if you see the uh, concoles and the trans we have always maintained that Dazda is abnormally high and that's why the uh, uh, percentage is high. You know, so you are just you cannot just pick up one period and then compare with that. No, sir. Even even FY22 also, I think we were close to 680 crores. So uh, I think uh, I, I yeah, just wanted I just wanted. So point is, it's not going down. It was one single product, whereas what you are seeing now is overall across all the products, in spite of and despite of rather the several challenges which we as the industry is facing outside. You know. I mean, it's very, it's very difficult to compare. The 1920 period was completely different, and what we are facing, the world is facing now, is completely different. So it will not be the numbers. So koi bhi analyze kar lega. But point is, uh, you must see the outside environment also when we are comparing this. Correct. correct. Uh, so second question is on uh, like one of our competitors is also expanding on the NT side. So how we are placed in terms of our existing utilization here because I think one of the monomer of ND is doing well because of the downstream agrochemicals is doing well. So if you can just help us explain uh, our exposure of sales to the agrochemicals out of our standalone business and uh, are our sales more prone towards the generic, niche generic or the patented agrochemical products where we supply those intermediates. Okay, so first of all, one thing I can correct here is I do not believe that there are any patented in, uh, agrochemical intermediates. Uh, the other thing that I can say is that we are running our plant at full utilization. Okay. We will also be looking at expanding that. We will also be, uh, you know, in our own manner, significantly improving the resilience of the, uh, the value chain. And we are already also going downstream. We have piloted several downstream products which come out of this chain. Those have been accepted by the customer with regards to quality. And now we are at an advanced stage of discussions for uh, volumes and uh, long-term contracts. Got it, sir. Got it. Thank you so much, sir. I have a few more questions, but I'll join back in the queue. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vivek Rajamani from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Um, hi, sir. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, two questions from my side. Uh, could you give some color on the demand trends that you've been witnessing uh, for your key end segments uh, in the month of April and May? Uh, if I believe in the last quarter you did say you started to see some green shoots, uh, so it would be great to get an update on that uh, by segment if it's possible. And the second question was uh, you've been mentioning that uh, the share of exports has been rising in your port portfolio of the last two quarters. Uh, just wanted to understand uh, what is the margin profile uh, for these export markets vis-a-vis -vis the domestic markets. And if there is a difference, what could be the differential? Thank you so much. Okay. So first of all, uh, thanks for the question. And interesting that you should mention color and green. Uh, but one thing that I can tell you is that our products, which are intermediates, are spread over multiple end applications. You can have the same product which goes into different end applications. However, right now, uh, you know, dyes and pigments is seeing a, a nadir in that sense with regards to demand and with regards to inventory levels even at uh, uh, customers and consumer ends. The segments which are doing better comparatively are oil and gas, explosives, 
<coughs> personal care, food, rubber, infrastructure, and segments which are relatively neutral are pharma and agro. Now, when I say neutral, I'm talking about it with regards to volumes. Uh, prices may go up or down, but in most cases, we are protected by uh, volume contracts with pass-through clauses. So uh, when I spoke earlier about exporting more, that is because in, uh, you know, in Q2 and Q3, the Indian demand for textiles when it comes to dyes and other intermediates was very, very poor. Whereas the export uh, need was higher because Europe had curtailed its available supply. And finally, when uh, oil prices were nearer to $120, there was a flurry of activity coming with, uh, into oil and uh, gas exploration. And as we are intermediates, we were able to pivot away from supplying to a, you know, a low demand domestic market, which prioritizes textiles towards a high demand export market which prioritize things like water treatment and oil chemicals. Now, this is where we are able to remain nimble. In India, many of these uh, segments have started showing a certain improvement, and hence we have been pivoting back towards India to an extent. Our export markets continue to remain served by us. The margin profiles on a net back basis, I would say are relatively similar for two reasons. One is that the uh, freight rates have normalized compared to their highs of last year. And B, that uh, you know there is a duty on our product when it is supplied to the US. So I am talking about net back rates, which also addresses the duty element. So our rates were not lower or higher compared to our domestic rates. And hence, in both cases, we are OK. We have adequate opportunities to grow in this segment, and we have the ability to pivot depending on end segment demand. And as we will have, uh, you know, uh, this year, we will have higher uh, productivity and higher production. We are hopeful that we will be able to cater to the growing demand without needing to lose wallet share from one end segment to another. I hope that answered your question. Um, sure, sir. Um, thank you so much. I'll reach on the queue. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohit Nagraj from Centrum Broking. Please go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks for the opportunity and uh, congratulations on a perfect score uh, through TFS audit. Uh, my, first, yeah, my first question is on uh, phenol capacity. So when we talk about 120%, uh, what is the base we are taking? Is it uh, 200 or 250? And we have again mentioned that uh, we will be uh, in debottlenecking further by 10%. So what will be the final capacity uh, that will be uh, on stream uh, in Q1? Thank you. So uh, base is 210. Uh, 200 KT. 200 KT. And when we say we have said it is above 120, so it is higher than that. And with debottlenecking and this, we are expecting 50% increase in the capacity. From 2 lakh? From the base. Right, right, got it. Uh, thanks for that clarification. Uh, so second question uh, is in terms of the uh, domestic demand. So exports demand has been very dynamic. Uh, what is uh, our understanding in terms of domestic demand for the products uh, which are further being exported by the uh, you know converters or the downstream players? Thank you. Uh, for which which segment are you talking? Are you talking about phenol uh, and acetone? Uh, no, uh, for the uh, uh, standalone segment. No, it doesn't matter no? whether you're exporting it or you're giving it to a domestic converter who is exporting it because the domestic converter has a contractual agreement with uh, an international client. It's essentially the same thing. And it depends on product to product because in the dye segment, there's not much of this. However, this is much more prevalent when it comes to agrochemicals. And as I mentioned earlier, we in in uh, in most of our cases, if not all of our cases in agrochemicals, we have uh, medium and long-term contracts. Some are annual and some are multi-year contracts. 
So the volumes are relatively protected. As in when we are able to de-bottleneck and make a little additional volume, we do have uh, you know, customers who we are able to supply that on a spot basis at the spot price. Sure, got it. Also, just want to ask clarification. Uh, in our press release or presentation, we have mentioned that there are 2,500 crores projects currently uh, which are undergoing. So, what is the completion timeline and capex for FY24 and uh, 25? What I mentioned earlier is that uh, the fluorination and photochlorination project will commission in uh, Q3. The phenol. Uh, you know, de-bottlenecking will finish to a certain extent in Q1 and with the advanced process control which will further improve on our already, uh, you know, standard, uh, you know, global standard quality will start to, uh, you know, get realized by Q2 and our uh, upstream project will be commissioned in Q4 and uh, downstream derivative of acetone which is also a solvent will be commissioned in Q1 of next year. In the meanwhile, as I had also alluded to hydrogenation, uh, multipurpose distillation, and a certain amount of uh, uh, you know, difficult, challenging nitration, this will all be commissioned over uh, you know, the uh, end of the second half of the year, all the way to the uh, you know, first quarter, end of the first quarter of the next year. Sure. Thank you so much. Project which we have announced. Finally, one last one which I forgot to mention. The, the polycarbonate compounding facility will be commissioned over the next 18 months. Sure, sure. Uh, that, that is helpful. Uh, thanks a lot and best of luck, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a request to all the participants. If you're using a speakerphone or hands-free, please pick up your handset while asking a question. This is required to ensure optimum audio quality on the call. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Chetan Thakkar from ASK Investment Managers Limited. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. So just two questions. Uh, one was uh, if you can throw some light on the domestic demand for MIBK and MIBC and uh, what is the capacity that we are putting up and how do we see that ramping up? And second was on the 2500 crore capex. If you can let us know how much it is into backward integration and what is the growth capex and what kind of IRR should we expect on the backward integration projects? Okay, uh, so first of all, MIBK and MIBC, uh, we are targeting for the entire volume of both products to be consumed in the domestic market. Uh, we will take the opportunity to export if we think that the realization is better, but uh, the domestic market has significant uh, scope for it. And when we are talking about uh, volumes, we are talking about 40 kT for MIBK and about 8 kT for MIBC. Both of these projects will be commissioned pretty much together. Mm. And with regards to upstream and downstream uh, integration, I would not consider that to be a crucial question. The upstream integration will be able to significantly add to our bottom line, no doubt. But while yeah. we're doing it, we are also confidently expanding our consumption capacities, which will therefore add to the top line. And those expansions come at a fraction of the capex that the upstream uh, uh, this thing projects require. So net net, I will look at even the upstream integration to be able to generate growth with minimum investment in the bottlenecking of our existing products. Yeah. So and as usual, we don't get into a lot of detail about the capex involved when we're talking about the bottlenecking of products. Got it. And so, uh, just to get a sense, the domestic total volume for MIBK and uh, MIBC. So, 40 and 8 is 40 and 8 is what we are setting up, or 40 and 8 is the domestic uh, consumption. It, both of these are the same. We are confident of being able to take 100% of the uh, requirement. Let's also keep in mind that the requirement is growing at a healthy CAGR. So we hope to apply ourselves to seeing how we can de-bottleneck this in short order after commissioning. But we're confident that we should be able to take uh, yeah, as close to 100% of the 
uh, consumption demand? Today it is 100% imported, which is in the same range. So that's what uh, I mean. We'll be able to supply to the market, substitute the import. Got it. And on the 2500, so the total capex that is there, is it fair to assume that since we are moving up the value chain, our uh, payback time should be anywhere between three to four years for these projects, which is essentially faster than uh, what it would have otherwise been? Yes, yes, you are right. Yeah, this is a correct assumption. Sure. Okay, sir. Thank you so much. All the best. Thank you. Just I'll highlight that you know when we count uh, payback, we are only considering the incremental value that we get. Got it. Yes, sir. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The next question is from the line of Abhijit Akella from Kodak Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for taking my questions. Hi, uh, Abhijit. Hi. Uh, first of all, on this uh, government incentive that's uh, mentioned in footnote three of the results, uh, you know, it was about 59 crores for the year compared to only one crore the previous year. So, just wanted to check if uh, you know whether this is the usual export incentive or it's something else, and is it a one-off item or do we expect it to continue in the future? Uh, Abhijit, can you come back on the question, please? One is incentive. What is that question? Uh, yeah, I was referring to footnote three of the results, uh, where yeah, yeah. there's a table showing the government incentive income. It shows about 59 crores for FY23. Yeah, 59, right. Uh, compared to only 1.6 crores in uh, FY22. So right, right. just was just trying to understand what this item exactly is and is this a recurring item going forward? It is a recurring item going forward. Uh, this is incentive given by the government for setting up the uh, project. And uh, I believe this will continue for next uh, five to six years. Okay. Is this at uh, Deepak Chemtech or uh, at Deepak Phenolics? This is Deepak Phenolics. Okay, okay. So we should expect the same number to sort of continue for the next five, six years. About numbers 60 make uh, vary up and down depending on, see, these are, there are various parameters on which the incentive is given. But you can uh, uh, roughly take the same amount year on year, not an issue. Can be a little higher also. Sure, understood. Thank you. Uh, second thing was just on the polycarbonate compounding capacity. Um, you know, it would be helpful if you could uh, please guide us a little bit on what sort of value addition we should expect, uh, you know, between the compounding uh, product versus the base polycarbonate that we'll eventually produce. So, you know, in terms of maybe the uh, price variance or the difference in margins, how much would roughly we expect on that? Uh, uh, Bridget, uh, see, this is rather than looking at, at this facility as a uh, uh, EBITDA in, uh, increase or something like that, more important is that we are setting a base for polycarbonate, you know. I mean, uh, when you are going out with polycarbonate, if you go with just the polycarbonate without knowing the market, uh, then it will be, it will not be the right. In fact, we want to go further one step beyond not just polycarbonate, but little polycarbonate derivatives also so that we have edge over the normal, you know, there are various poly applications of polycarbonate. Which application makes sense for us, where to go, where is uh, the strength lies and where is the demand growing. I mean, these are all parameters we will test by getting into polycarbonate compounding facility first for which we have sanctioned to 50 crores and we are actively working on that. Parallelly, we will start work on polycarbonate, but this has to happen first. This is a precursor to the polycarbonate. It will certainly, certainly, when you select the right application, your EBITDA is bound to go up uh, than normal uh, polycarbonate. I will refrain from giving any numbers now because we are ourselves studying, but it's the whole idea is to make your product more, uh, I would say, uh, not a commoditized product, but uh, somewhere it is uh, getting a color of uh, uh, value addition. I'll, I'll just uh, add one point here. This is, uh, you know, what you would consider as seed marketing because customer approvals, especially for high value uh, compounds, it takes anywhere from like, you know, six months to a year and a half. So our goal is to make sure that we put our foot in the door there. Now, of course, it is uh, a cherry on the top that the financials do, uh, they do look attractive in any way. 
when we're talking about the compounding facility, but the purpose of investing the, you know, these few hundred crores is so that we can fast track the approval and validation process with the customers. And in the meanwhile, we work to see how we can connect between our current uh, product portfolio and the manufacturing over a period of time so that we are end to end uh, completely integrated. Thank you, thank you, that's helpful. Uh, next question I just had was on the uh, contracting within the business. Uh, you know, the presentation does mention that significant part of the business is contracted. So if it's possible to give us some sense of, you know, uh, roughly, I mean, what percentage of the uh, uh, volumes might actually be contracted and what's the pricing arrangement on these? Are we uh, sort of giving, uh, you know, three monthly pricing arrangements or is it longer than that? Uh, that would be helpful. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the management line has been disconnected. Kindly stay connected while we try to reconnect them. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently holding. The management's line has been connected. Over to you, sir. Yeah, Abhijit. Yeah, sorry. I'm not sure if you heard my question, sir. I'll just uh, repeat it. Yeah. Uh, it was basically with regard to the, uh, uh, let's say, the you know volume of contracted uh, arrangements in the business. Uh, the presentation mentions that uh, there is contracted supply of products from both the segments, which provides high visibility for continued growth. So just sort of wondering, uh, you know, if uh, we could share what percentage of the business might be contracted in both the businesses and what sort of pricing agreements do we normally have? Is it on a quarterly basis for these contracts or is it longer term? Uh, I will ask about the answer about the pricing first because, see, pricing is not, uh, it's always formula based. In today's world, nobody uh, gives you a fixed price unless it is only a couple of months or a maximum for a quarter. So uh, there is no fixed pricing arrangement uh, uh, in most of the cases. In finance specialty segment, yes, there will be a, a few contracts where it is uh, fixed pricing, but where margins are certainly in our control and uh, that way. Uh, in BNL, uh, this volume should be in the range of uh, around uh, 25 to 30 percent, whereas DPL is in the range of 20 to 25 percent, the contracted business. Okay, uh, but uh, if you know, by and large, we have same set of suppliers in BNL also, in DPL also, I mean, and they are with us for years and ages. I mean, DPL also, we are uh, supplying to the uh, uh, most of the uh, 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 large consumers and they continue with us. In today's market, they nobody enters into a long-term contract, which you also know. Sure, sure. No, thank you so much. That's really helpful. Just one last quick clarification and I'll get back in the queue. Uh, on slide seven, we have shared some volumes. So, for example, uh, sales of inorganic intermediates of 7,600 tons and hydrogenation volumes. Just wanted to clarify, are these for the quarter or for the full year? 7,000 would be in a month. For the quarter, for the quarter. We will come back to you with this answer. Sorry about that. Sure, sure. No problem. Thanks a lot and wish you all the best. Thank you. We have the next question from the line of Rohan Gupta from Nuvama Wealth Management. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, sir. Uh, good evening and thanks for the opportunity. Uh, sir, first, just clarification on this our phenol business in terms of the sourcing and uh, availability of ammonia, where you have said that 
we used to have a lower cost availability but the things have changed now in terms of the our Mr. Kutta, your voice is muffled. May I request you to use your handset, please, to ask a question? Yeah, just a second. Yeah, hi, sir. Hope it is better now. Yes, sir. Please continue. Yeah, sir. I was asking on this ammonia sourcing and uh, for our phenol production cost. So, how do you see that? Uh, you have mentioned that uh, the changes has been there already in place for the cost structure. What we are required as we are. Going versus going forward now. So with the falling gas prices globally and also in India, how we see that our gas cost and ammonia cost of production will come, ammonia cost will come down, and how the phenol spread uh, in your view is going to move in near future? If you can just give some sense on that. Uh, so both of these are challenging questions to answer with this volatility. One thing that I can say is that right now, while the gas prices are temporarily subdued. especially in the summer season in europe what we will end up having is compared to last year an increase in the production of ammonia in the meanwhile most places have uh, large inventory stockpiles of urea so there will i believe be more ammonia available for chemical companies such as deepak there will also be an increase in the uh, new capacities that come in with regards to ammonia production which i hope will give at least some level of uh, consistency with regards to price and availability now beyond that with regards to the spread between uh, phenol acetone and their upstreams these are linked in some uh, a, to some extent uh, you know to crude but one thing that has happened over the last two years is that that very easy uh, linkage where you were able to de- you know derive uh, Uh, you know some sort of a regression analysis that has broken because even the consumption has been affected styrene monomer which is a benzene downstream is doing reasonably okay compared to before but uh, polyurethanes in fact are not at the current time in the meanwhile paraxylene is not doing well therefore there is lower production of benzene some refineries are down because they do not want to manufacture at a volatile crude price so this has currently affected that easy predictability what i can definitely say is that benzene currently is exhibiting some level of resilience propylene is getting softer we'll see how this goes as more plants either tone down their production or increase it depending on availability of crude so very difficult uh, question to answer given the current circumstances but one thing is for sure i think uh, everybody whether it's a manufacturer or whether it is a uh, uh, you know a consumer everyone expected that even this year would be business as usual and i i don't understand why because the large second largest player in the chemical space which is china it came back with a bang in uh, you know from january onwards with huge stockpiles of uh, you know manufactured product which they had not earlier moved out of the country for reasons of labor and availability and some such so of course you are going to have a short uh, term situation where there is a glut in the market of certain products simply because they need to exhaust their inventory levels as well the situation will normalize what that means is difficult to answer but you must look at the last quarter and the current quarter keeping this brand new dark horse also in mind the largest player coming back disrupts the entire supply chain so sir it means that with the china situation and that you said that the way the chinese production is coming in the market and uh, uh, since they have just started coming in the market there may be high supplies of phenol in the market where you see that going forward or in a near term in all prices can further come down no absolutely this is not what i am saying let me reiterate first of all we do not have we have not in the past and we do not in the present or in the near term in the future next year or whatever it is expect to have competition coming from chinese phenol we have had uh, phenol coming from other countries but not china and at least i can assure you that when it comes to phenol acetone and ipa your company remains resilient with regards to its wallet share 
and most of it or if not all of it is dedicated to domestic consumption which is also on an improving trend so you don't need to be worried about china coming in into india with uh, you know uh, value destructive prices and phenol and acetone but sir uh, still a large part of domestic market is fed from the phenol import as what i understand the phenol business we okay. may have a control on domestic consumption the volume we are not worried about but That's pricing sir will be determined determined by the global prices china is a large producer as well as a very large consumer of phenol so china generally speaking is a producer and a consumer and it will focus on increasing and maintaining its consumption activities within china itself china has never in the past been a global player when it comes to the export of phenol it is self sufficient just like it is in say the chloroalkali industry it is the largest producer of caustic chlorine uh, but it does not affect the uh, you know the global trade flows in any way thank you sir just last bit from my side and i'll come back in queue on our further phenol expansion sir has we any further future plan or is it in near term any further plan on expansion of the phenol plant sir yes there is uh, a uh, rohan this your uh, this question is again linked to your earlier question also frankly china no china india today imports around 2 lakh tons of phenol the demand is growing significantly okay and have we not surprised you people giving higher corrects and higher numbers than what you people have expected i mean it's not only the price game and china comes so kya hoga ye hoga to kya hoga there are other things also like in first commentary we said that we are digitalizing our systems and processes which is going to improve our efficiency that you do not know what the impact is quite large you know those by doing those things operational efficiency on top of it you have we have other products which are also equally doing well like ams and acetone is uh, an ipa so i mean let's not get too much we too much into china remarks and these remarks we are very confident that this year also will give you a good result don't worry on that there is a room for one more player i must tell you i mean what you are because india is growing significantly in phenol and Yes, at an appropriate time, we may also uh, come to the market, but then you have to wait for that. Thank you, sir. Thanks uh, for answering my question. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Noshar Chaudhary from Aditya Birla Sun Life AMC. Please go ahead. Yeah. Hi. Uh, thanks. Just. Uh, uh one clarification sir uh, if i remember it correctly earlier we had indicated uh, uh, the project in uh, phenolics regions i think uh, it was butyl phenol we were talking about uh, can you uh, uh what is the status uh, currently of this project uh, what kind of uh, uh, investment we are planning and uh, by when should it uh, be commercialized no this was a conjecture we are not uh, looking at butylated phenols Okay. So where we have announced it, I don't think we have ever made any announcement. Okay, okay. And secondly, sir, um, on the investment pipeline of 2,500 crore rupees, uh, uh, as of uh, FY23 closing, uh, uh, on a base of 1,300 crore rupees of EBITDA, with this investment of 2,500 crore rupees, uh, where we should. Uh, 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 Okay. How much EBITDA it could contribute uh, on yeah, the basis of the energy? Yeah. Let me let me just uh, let me just uh, uh, give some light here. Uh, over the next four years, four to five years, we are planning uh, as a group to be doubling the revenue that we have had in FY23, and the uh, products that we are getting into are a mix. between downstreams of uh, deepak nitrite and downstreams of phenolics the margin mix will be similar so this is what we are putting into motion over next 4 uh, years and uh, doubling of revenue and doubling of gross profit and ebitda should we uh, uh, take it uh, uh, the same way because uh, revenue uh, would be uh, 
As, as I mentioned, the margin profile is similar. I hope you are not asking about the percentage margin. Understood. Understood. So, uh, understood. So, uh, 1300 crore rupees of uh, EBITDA and 2600 crore rupees of gross uh, profit should be doubling ideally with the kind of investment we are doing. I am just reiterating, margin profile is similar to the current margin profile in a normalized year. Uh, FY23 was slightly suboptimal in that sense. But if it was a normalized year, we would be talking about doubling of the revenue and a similar margin profile over the next four years. Understood. Got it. Thank you and all the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Krishan Parwani from GM Financial. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi, uh, Malik Bhai. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, two or th yeah, two or three clarifications. So, uh, so one is on the photochlorination. So, just wanted to understand: is it for side chain reaction of toluene or xylene as well? And is fluorination being done for reducing the import dependency? So, photochlorination, what we have put up as an asset, is an up-engineered asset, and uh, you're right that it can do toluene, but it can also do. Uh, others like xylene. Mm -hmm. The asset itself will start off with a base chemical and then uh, we will be looking at uh, you know utilizing part of the asset which is actually broken down into multiple uh, plants. So we're talking about photochlorination but it's done in multiple trains. Mm -hmm. So we will be able to dedicate individual trains to different products as we require them. Uh, the balancing equipment is all that will be required which is minor and uh, which can be executed very quickly. And with regards to the fluorination, this is in a similar fashion up engineered when it comes to the MOC, the pressure, the temperature that it can handle. So while it may make one product to start off with which will reduce our uh, you know, uh, volatility and uh, you know, increase our ability to deliver higher value intermediates, it is also designed with the intention of manufacturing products which are using this platform but are not directly connected to any existing value chain. Understood. Uh, thanks for this. So we'll also be able to operate individually in individual trains. Understood. Uh, the second is on, uh, so on the phenolic side, um, can we also think of adding, let's say, diacetone alcohol or hexylene glycol because you know they also are imported into India and there's a high demand so just 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 wondering about that no, so these are all very good ideas certainly we can talk about them later uh, because they are you know being worked on whether they should be worked on with a high priority or a low priority again the question is what is going to get us to as I mentioned earlier doubling of our revenue in the next four years is it going to be a better substitute to something else that we may be working on uh, it's worth considering understood and and just the last bit uh, on the uh, capex front so um, i know i think you mentioned about the commercialization schedule etc but uh, i'm sorry if i missed out so can you just give us a capex breakup of 24 and 25 and the commercial schedule once again sorry thank you uh, the capex breakup i won't give you because these are all in process uh, because the capex breakup might include capexes which we have not yet announced so that we can achieve our uh, you know target four year target five year target the commercialization is only 2500 ah, okay if you're only talking about the 2500 which we have already announced yes uh, very quickly we have uh, you know the phenol D bottlenecking happening in q1 the acp the advanced process apc happening in q2 we have photochlorination and fluorination happening in Q3. We have the upstream integration happening in Q4. And we have the uh, acetone derivatives happening in uh, Q1 of next year. And between Q, uh, Q4 to Q1, we will also be commissioning our expanded hydrogenation, multipurpose distillation, and multipurpose nitration. Understood. That's very so helpful. A lot of things are happening in next I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, sir, your audio is not coming on the management line. I would request you to kindly unmute yourself. Yeah. 
Ladies and gentlemen, kindly stay connected while we try to reconnect the while we try to reconnect the management. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for patiently holding. The management line has been connected. Over to you, sir. Yeah, so uh, the whatever we have announced are 2,500. Each quarter from next quarter onwards, you will find one or other project getting materialized, and the numbers will itself speak on that. So, uh, as Molly gave uh, uh, project wise details. You can consider all this coming up in next two years, 2,500, and the revenue doubling of revenue. What four years? There are different plans. Understood. So just 2,500 is for 24 and 25 combined for whatever you have announced. Uh, 25 could be higher uh, depending on whether you announce a project or not. Correct. Right, right. You are right. Correct. Uh, sorry, last one that I forgot to mention is uh, the compounding facility, which will be commissioned over the next 18 months. Understood. And sorry, uh, I think I've, I missed one point, uh, just last point on the reason for higher phenolic spread this quarter. I mean, if you have on a gross level, that is before power fuel and other expenses. So just that's my, that's the last one for me. In, in Q4, yes. Uh, actually compared to sequentially in Q3, we had a rather unfortunate incident out of our control when the largest, uh, you know, supplier uh, of one of the feedstocks had an extended shutdown longer than was uh, originally announced and hence we were forced to buy the intermediate cumin from the uh, you know global market at prices which would be much higher than what we would have manufactured at ourselves mm -hmm. and this has impacted our q3 numbers of course in q4 we did not need to do that and our supply of raw materials was steady as was our phenol and acetone to customers perfect thank you for patiently answering my question wish you all thank the you. best Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nitin Tiwari from Yes Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, good evening, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm sorry if you've already answered this question and it's a repetition, but just wanted to know uh, what is the purchase of finished goods uh, uh, in uh, reported in this quarter of about 122 crores? I think that is cumin. So, um, as Mr. Mehta was just uh, mentioning, this cumin is uh, purchases for this quarter. It was for the last quarter. I mean, I didn't uh, quite get that. Q3 largely Q3. It will be Q. It's Q3 largely. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, Q3 also had a small figure of about 16 crores, and in Q4 we are looking at a figure of 122 crores. So there is a large purchase in Q4 as well of cumin. Yes. So we had, uh, so we did have you know, uh, the regular shutdown that we have, which is for catalyst replacement and uh, maintenance activities, along with uh, you know uh, minor activities that were done for uh, some expansions, resulted in a period where we did uh, purchase a little bit. Understood. And on the phenol expansion, I mean, I just wanted uh, to get some clarification. So right now, uh, we are operating capacity at 250,000 tons per annum, is it? Uh, or, it or the nameplate is still 2 lakh tons per annum? No, nameplate is nameplate. Forget about the nameplate. Okay. So what, uh, what I can tell you is that normally with most chemical manufacturing plants, especially ones which are continuous in nature, which require cooling and chilling, uh, mm -hmm. the plant... Uh, uh, throughput is higher in winter because of a uh, cooler environment and lower in the summer. And hence, we have actually touched much higher numbers in winter 
the debottlenecking activities will allow us to manufacture at a much higher rate through the entire year. Maybe possibly try to squeeze out a couple of more tons in winter if possible. So when we say increase our uh, throughput even in summer months. Understood. So when we say 120 percent utilization, that's 120 percent of 200,000 tons. Or, or as we had alluded uh, in June last year, that we have uh, now operational capacity to work at 250,000. So is it 120 percent of 120 percent uh, of 250,000? or 200,000 is what I'm trying to understand. It is, what we have said is above 120%. Uh -huh. We have not given you exact 120%. It is more than that. But 120% of what? You're, uh, right. You're right. So it is more than 120%. And with this de-bottlenecking in this, we are definitely going to have 3 legs. So I think let's, uh, let's not do too much of mess 120 ka 240 or 260 because that will keep on varying based on this, but our capacity will touch uh, 50 percent higher than two leg that's the base so uh, all right so we will be roughly be at 300 after the ready bottleneck yes, yes. Uh, uh, understood and sir uh, lastly my last question sir if i may uh, so sir how do we uh, how do we look at the phenolic spicing so as you mentioned that uh, 30 percent roughly uh, like you know is contracted so my is this understanding correct that rest 70 percent business in phenol is uh, pot market related? So is that right understanding? That is one. And secondly, if that's the case, then how do we see the pricing for us? Because uh, like you know, if we look at the March quarter, as far as uh, like you know, Asian prices are concerned, we did see some weakness in phenol and acetone prices and crack. And uh, so how do we like you know? Uh, uh, basically, foresee our cracks and pricing in, in, in the backdrop of how Asian prices be. So, if you can just throw some light on that. No, but this contracted, then you have not heard my second this thing because I said it is always a short term contract and a formula based price. We are not contracting anything on a long term basis because neither the customer would want that nor we will want that. Right. Okay, prices keep, keep on fluctuating. In Deepak Nitrite, you will have. Finance specialty business at a uh, at a price for maybe for six months, nine months, but not in Fenol. There are no right. fixed price contracts in Fenol. So, so, so uh, the pricing contracts are short term and or either spot is what you're saying. Yes, but volumes are tied up. Volumes are tied up. And so on the pricing front, so how do we try and like, you know, understand the pricing that we have vis-a-vis -vis the Asian pricing? If you can just help us understand that a little bit. Because there's a contrast in the way Asian prices have behaved in the quarter and the way our margins have behaved. But you are linking where the prices with margin. You do not consider our other things, which I repeat. There are efficiencies. There are other products. I mean, it must be, uh, let me honest very honestly, whether it was better than what you expected or no. Sir, 100% better than what I was expecting. And that's why I'm curious to know, like, uh, understand that how, how, how do we see it going so forward? Every quarter, I have been, we have been surprising you. Every quarter, you ask me, kya kare ke, kyo aisa aata hai, acha dete hai, to bhi you question. Nain, nain, sir, aasi baat nishin samajh li ki koshish kar rahe hai, bas. Koshish tum kama se ni, mein nahi kar raha hoon, tum kyo kar rahe ho? All right, understood, great, great. And congratulations and all the best for the future. Sir. Well, I must tell you again and again, we are doing really well. The, uh, I mean, there are several steps we are taking. There is a product called AMS, which was earlier going to China, where our relation was very low. Now we are going to Europe with that. That is also adding to the phenol margins. You know, these things are never ever considered by you people. Okay, so those things are definitely like Molly was mentioning, cumin and this, there is, there is definitely an impact of that. So when you consider with that vis-a-vis, -vis, then this year we are going to do better as against last year also. So there are several improvements which we keep on doing, you know, because we cannot, if we think like this, then we will not be able to run our business. But we are taking, taking so much of steps, so many steps, right, so to strengthen our business and make our base so sound, which gives the numbers. And this is what we precisely we are doing, you know, doubling the capacity. These are all there, of course. We, it will be there in there, but then first you make your business solid. That's what we try to do. Like Abhijit ka question on this inorganic, that is the export 
for the quarter we have done a, a export also really well for this quarter uh, this year you know so, and so these are all things which we continue to do and which i mean strengthens our uh, bottom line and business thank you sir the next question is from the line of john k raman from franklin mutual fund please go ahead thank you um good evening mr meta and uh, congrats yeah, good evening, to good evening, yeah good evening mr padhyay congrats to you and your team for a very creditable performance thank um, you so so mr meta mentioned that you know china's return to the chemical industry is a big given for this year and in that context you know while uh, deepak phenol business may be immune to that uh, development uh, will the other operating segments will they be um, impacted by that either on the raw material side or on the finished goods either positive or uh, uh, adverse impacts so china uh, currently operates as a wild card what we believe influences our performance in dnl stand alone more is the volatility in the consumer buying behavior uh, we maintain very very high uh, wallet shares with our customers and our customers have been gracious enough to always give us a premium over whatever the uh, you know the prices in china are let me also reiterate that uh, you know in uh, in uh, in 2020 and in 2021 china was operating at full in 22 did it go into a partial or total shutdown so while the rest of the world did have a covid uh, induced uh, lockdown and scare in 2021 22 uh, in 2020 and 21 we were competing head on with china in every one of our products and we were able to maintain strong uh, you know performance so while china is there customers continue to prefer to buy from deepak regardless of whatever happens we are always confident that our operational efficiencies are as good as china is not better in every one of our products in most of the products we actually have to compete in european markets with giants like dsf and langsess as well where you know while they are not chinese companies they have a home market advantage which we have to be able to match so when we are global scale we have the uh, capability and the experience to match that so i will only say that uh, what i am cautious about is uh, you know inflation and consumer buying behavior while they continue to buy the same volumes from us they remain uh, you know more focused on what will happen over the next 3 months and 6 months nonetheless every one of our customers who has an annual or a multi year contract with us has reiterated multiple times in the last couple of months that the entirety of the contract is to be honored both by deepak as well as by them they recognize that volatility is are there they are there in the short term but they are expecting us to honor those commitments just as much as we are expecting them those relationships continue to grow and we are looking at expanding the amount of business even in new products that we have with these same customers even when these are products which are new uh, extensions to our existing product basket and value chain got it and again from a broader perspective the last 3 4 years the kind of roc that deepak has generated is fairly uh, impressive um in light of this and the fact that you will be committing a large amount of capex over the next 2 years um can you sustain this this levels of uh, mid 20s uh, roc mid 20s is easier to sustain right now we have been operating at the high 30s and the low 40s so mid 20s sounds uh, doable right excellent thanks mr meta all the best thank you very much thank you the next question is from the line of meet vora from access capital please go ahead yeah i said uh, thanks for taking my question so i just wanted to understand the dynamics of a phenol asset on plant so for example uh, we have set up a plant with a nameplate capacity of 2 lakh tons 
now we are de bottlenecking it by 50% and taking it to 3 lakh tons for example if our requirement of phenol acetone increases going further how much we can de bottleneck further till the time where there is a need for setting up another capacity we there is a need for setting up another capacity beyond 3 lakhs i mean this is something that we will have to be i mean we are actively working on this because uh, the amount of easy headroom is limited after 3 lakh it is still possible but uh, it takes more effort uh, and maybe after that you know it will start coming with certain uh, possible downsides when we are making 150% we are confident of being able to do it without any impact whatsoever with regard to the reliability and the maintenance of the plant anything beyond that and we start having to take compromises we are not willing to so we do need to actively work to see how we can maintain and grow our wallet share but here also i will rather add to what molik is saying our technical team they have always surprised us we used to believe that we cannot cross 250 we have crossed 250 then 275 now 3 lakh so people are giving a surprise they are saying there is no capacity it is more to do with the competency and i will not be surprised if they can they give me 5 10000 more uh, beyond uh, 3 lakh also so i mean let's keep our fingers crossed but then there is a need for one more plant now that is for sure sure so and also if you can highlight uh the capex that we need to do for example we set uh, we did a capex of around 1400 crores for our original 2 lakh tons now how much capex would we have spent on this additional 1 lakh tons de bottlenecking that we did over and above the 2 lakh tons capacity fine uh, less than 100 crores where have you seen anything in my balance sheet showing higher capex you people are, you must appreciate this are sure sir <laughs> uh, so we have done hardly any capex on the additional 1 lakh tons yeah actually the only capex that we did were on ipa and the power plant okay that that's great sir uh, and sir second question uh, regarding uh, sir if you can share any update on the sodium nitrate project in oman that we have we had announced the last quarter yeah so that is going along on track so you have to remember it's a different country which has its own uh, challenges but we're targeting uh, between 24 to 30 months for commissioning as i mentioned earlier uh, this is in line with that sure sir uh, thanks that's all from my side thank, thank you. you the next question is from the line of anika mittal from invest research please go ahead hello am i audible yes yes ma'am hello yes yeah, you are i can hear you hello um, yeah uh, i have only two questions so my first question is why is this delay in the commissioning of the project what factors have contributed to this delay in commissioning and how will it impact the potential return which which delay which project delay so uh, in quarter three presentation all the projects were uh, they were delayed by one quarter so i will tell you in mibk and mibc plant Uh, in quarter three presentation, it was written that they will be commissioned by quarter four twenty four financial year. But in in this presentation, in this quarter's presentation, it is written it will be uh, commissioned in quarter one financial twenty five. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, there were certain okay. challenges when it came to the uh, you know the technology supplier and some part of the engineering. Uh, this is partially okay. also owing to some challenges that they have faced. from their own subcontractors in europe uh, these are actually very large and uh, complicated uh, uh, assets especially the columns and uh, they have a significant en- amount of engineering required nonetheless i do believe i hope that the problem is behind us so we should have a better chance of sticking to the schedule that we have announced we see what best we can do to try to bring it forward but uh, what we are telling you is something that uh, it seems uh, something that we are willing to commit to all right um so my second question is um, we are expanding our businesses in downstream and upstream products which are more profitable and value added than our current offerings 
we have more than doubled our uh, revenue from 2700 in 2020 2019 to 60, 6800 in 2022 however our margins have been affected by the fluctuations in commodity prices which makes us look like a commodity driven company rather than a value added one we are not saying that we can avoid the volatility of the industry but we believe that our margins can improve with our new product so my question is when you think we can be recognized as a value added company rather than a pure play commodity one we are neither a pure play commodity company nor are we a cdmo company we are a diversified chemical manufacturing company which has significant operational excellence and a wide uh, basket of operational platforms that we can put into play now uh, when you see uh, you know things like margin pressures and all at the same time you have also seen uh, rather i mean if you look at say deepak nitrate right, that we had a fire incident mm -hmm. i accept that and that has resulted in an impact with regards to our percentages but over the last 3 years mm -hmm. you would or you know every quarter you will see a remarkably stable uh, you know margin profile for the company as a whole and that's because of the length and the breadth of our value chain now when it comes to phenolics yes of course there is a nature uh, you know commodity uh, uh, margin creeping in and that is one of the reasons why there are certain projects which are more focused on downstream rather than upstream in phenolics DNL has invested in uh, investment both in upstream as well as downstream. Phenolix has only investment in downstream, and those investments will have margin profiles which are similar to Deepak Nitrate standalone, and help between them will help to elevate the margin profile of what you would consider the Phenolix business to something which is somewhere between its current profile and Deepak Nitrate. so uh, please do not uh, you know make the mistake of treating us as a pure play commodity again let me highlight we are a diversified chemical manufacturing company we prioritize on intermediates because this is where we believe we can play a great uh, you know role with regard to operational capabilities our roce please find me companies in uh, commodity space or in what you would call the cdm or the specialty space which have consistently over 14 quarters been able to deliver higher than 35% roci mm -hmm. while also making new investments for growth yes it was my right all right thank you thank you right thank you ladies and gentlemen that was the last question for today i would now like to hand the conference over to the management for closing comments over to you sir Thank you all for joining this call. In case you have any further questions, you can write to us for getting in touch with Mr. Somshekar Nanda, Mr. Gopal Thakkar. Thank you all. Thank you once again. Thank you very much, sir. On behalf of IIFL Securities Limited, that concludes this conference. Thank you for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.